what better way of spending the quarantine than by reading Nietzsche? Hello, my name is Joseph Sulia, and I will be reading for you my translation of Beyond Good and Evil, the fifth section on the natural history of morals. My name is spelled uh, Joseph Sulia. My last name is spelled S-U-G-L-I-A. The fifth section on the natural history of morals, 186. In today's Europe, moral sensation is just as delicate, old, multifarious, easily stimulable, and refined as the science of morals that belongs to it, which is still young, amateurish, vulgar, and thummy. This is an appealing contrast, one that is sometimes visible and corporeal in the person of the moralist, him or herself. Even the phrase, the science of morals, is far too arrogant and tasteless in comparison with what it describes, since good taste always prefers the more modest expression, more modest expressions than the science of morals. With the greatest rigor, we should admit what is necessary and what will be provisionally correct for a long time in the future namely the gathering of materials and comprehensible concepts and the arrangement of a monstrous regime of tender feelings of value and value distinctions, feelings and distinctions that live, grow, reproduce, and die. Perhaps all of this will be preparatory for a typology of morals to attempt to make the recurrent and frequent formations of this living crystallization perceptible. No one was indeed this modest before. All of the philosophers demanded with a rigid seriousness that brought one to laughter, something loftier, more fastidious, more solemn. As soon as they conceived of their morals as a science, they wanted the grounding of their morals. Morals themselves were considered as a given, how far away from their crass pride was the task of describing morals, this unimpressive seeming task that was abandoned to the dust and the rot. Although for them, no hands or senses could be refined enough for the job. Because these moral philosophers knew moral facts only crudely in the form of an arbitrary abstract or in the form of an accidental abbreviation. They knew something about the morality of their own environment, their class, their church, the spirit of their age, their climate, their little stretch of earth. Because these moral philosophers were poorly trained with respect to people, with respect to periods of human history, with respect to antiquities, and weren't even eager to learn about them. Because of all of this, they never even stared at morality in the face. Morality, which only discloses itself when one compares many different kinds of morals. Every previous so-called science of morals has failed to grasp the problem of morality itself, as strange as that might sound. Even the, suspicion is missing. Even the suspicion is missing. The suspicion that there is anything problematical about morality itself is missing. What philosophers called the grounding of morals and what they attempted to bring into existence was seen in the proper light. Nothing more than an educated form of good faith in the dominant morality. What they named the grounding of morals was nothing more than a, new, than a new means of expression, therefore a factuality within a specific form of morality. Indeed, in the final analysis, it was a kind of denial that this morality is permitted to even be grasped as a problem to begin with. And in any case, it is the converse of testing, dissecting, interrogating, and vivisecting this faith this faith in morality. Here, for instance, the almost admirable innocence with which Schopenhauer 
describes his own task. Draw your own inferences about the scientificity of this science, in quotation marks, from the way in which the last master of morality still speaks. Schopenhauer speaks as if he were a child. The principle, he says, on page 136 of the Foundation of Morals, the foundational axiom, the content of which all ethicists agree upon, neminem lede immo omnes quantum potes juva. Injure no one, rather help everyone as much as you can. This is actually the proposition that every teacher of ethics has striven to ground. It is the actual foundation of ethics, the philosopher's stone, which has been sought for centuries, end of quotation. The difficulty of grounding the proposition cited above might indeed be great. It is well known that Schopenhauer also was not successful. Whoever has not fundamentally felt how tastelessly false and sentimentalistic this proposition is, in a world the essence of which is the will to power. Whoever has not felt this should remember that Schopenhauer, even though he was a pessimist, actually played the flute. Yes, after dinner. Every day after dinner. You can read about it in his biography. And incidentally, one might ask, a pessimist? A repudiator of God? A repudiator of the world who stops at morality? Someone who assents to morality and who plays the flute to lede nimenum morality, to hurt nobody morality? How could such a person actually be a pessimist? 187, aside from the worth of such assertions as there is within us a categorical imperative, one might pose the question, what does such an assertion say about the one who makes it? There are morals which justify their creators before others. Other morals are meant to pacify him and to make him feel harmoniously at peace with himself. Some morals are designed to nail him to the cross and to humiliate him. Through other morals, he wishes to exact revenge. Through others, he wishes to hide himself. Through others, he or she wishes to transfigure himself or herself and to project himself or herself into the remoteness, into the heights, one moral allows its creator to forget something. The other serves to sentence him or something about him to oblivion. More than a few moralists impose their power and creative mood on humanity. Many others, perhaps even Kant, articulate the following understanding through their moralities. What is most respectable about me is that I can obey and with you, it shall not be otherwise than it is with me. In brief, morals are nothing more than a semiology of affects. 188, every morality is a portion of tyranny against nature, against reason, in quotation marks, in contrast with the laissez aller the let it be, the let it go. That, however, is no objection against morality. You still have to declare from another morality that every form of tyranny and reason are impermissible. The most essential valuable feature of every morality is that it is a long compulsion. If you want to understand Stoicism or Port Royal or Puritanism, Puritanism. You have to call to mind the compulsion which has brought every language to its strength and to its freedom, the metrical compulsion, the tyranny of rhyme and rhythm. Look at the distress that every poet and every orator and every population goes through, 
Some of today's prose writers are not exempt from this compulsion either. An implacable conscience dwells in their ears. The utilitarian dolts say, and think that they are clever for saying, that the compulsion is done out of stupidity. The anarchists who think of themselves as free and free spirit consider compulsion to be submission to an arbitrary law. The amazing fact is, however, that everything on earth that exists or that has existed that has anything to do with freedom, sophistication, boldness, dance, and masterly confidence, whether it is in the realm of thinking or ruling or speaking or persuasion or in the arts or in ethics, all of these things have developed by means of the tyranny of arbitrary law, in quotation marks. And for anything that is serious, there is no small probability that it is which, and it is that it is this, which is nature, in quotes, and natural, in quotes, and not laissez aller. Every artist knows how remote from the feeling of self abandonment is his most natural condition. The free arrangement, the positioning, the joining, the forming that, ha that happens, that happens in the moments of, quote, inspiration. He knows or she knows how rigorously and subtly he or she obeys the thousandfold laws, laws that make a mockery of conceptual formulation on the basis of their severity and their determinateness. Compared with these laws, even the most fixed concept is something fluid, multiple, ambiguous about it. To say it one more time, the most essential thing in heaven and on earth, it seems to me, is obedience for a long time and in a single direction. By means of this obedience, something comes about that makes life on earth worth living in the long run. For example, virtue, art, music, dance, reason, spirituality, something transfigurative, refined, crazy, and divine. The long on freedom of the spirit, the mistrustful restraint that is placed upon the communicability of his thought or her thought, the discipline that the thinker inflicts upon himself or herself, whether he or she is thinking within the constraints of ecclesiastical or courtly guidelines, or whether his thinking is based on Aristotelian presuppositions. The long intellectual will to interpret everything that happens according to a Christian schema and to uncover the Christian God within every accidental occurrence and to justify every accidental occurrence by reference to the Christian God, all of this violence, all of this arbitrariness, all of this severity, all of this counter rationality has been set up as the means through which strength, reckless curiosity and refined motility have been bred into the European spirit. Admittedly, an irreplaceable loss of power and spirit also resulted from these constraints. Power and spirit had been suppressed, smothered, and ruined, for here as in everywhere else, nature as it is, shows itself in its profligate and indifferent magnificence, which is outrageous yet dignified. For millennia, European thinkers thought that they were proving something Today, things are the opposite. Every thinker who wishes to prove something raises our suspicions. The results that were supposed to emerge from their most rigorous contemplation have already long since been established, whether it is Asiatic astrology or as it is today, the benign Christian moralistic interpretation of one's most intimate personal experiences for the honor of God, in quotation marks, or for the salvation of the soul, in quotation marks. Such tyranny, such arbitrariness, such rigorous and grandiose idiocy have educated the spirit. Slavery is, it would seem, the indispensable means for the cruder and the more refined intellects. Every morality may be viewed in this way. Nature is that which teaches us to hate the laissez-aller the all too vast freedom. Nature 
is that which implants the need for restricted horizons, for narrower tasks. Nature teaches us the narrowing of perspective. And therefore, in a sense, stupidity as the condition of life and the condition of growth. You shall obey someone and you shall obey that person for a long time. Otherwise, you will be destroyed and finally lose your self-respect. This seems to me to be the moral imperative of nature, which is hardly categorical, as old Kant demanded it to be. Hence the otherwise. Nor is nature directed toward the individual, for what does nature care about the individual? Rather, nature is directed to populations, races, periods of history, classes, and above all, the whole animal called the human being. Nature is directed to the human being. Yeah, there's something that Nietzsche calls elsewhere. He doesn't use this phrase in this passage. And this is a phrase that he borrows from Schopenhauer. Liberum arbitrium indifferentia. Which means the free choice of indifference. The free choice of indifference, the liberty of indifference. Um, the free choice of indifference, the all too vast freedom, arbitrary freedom, the laissez aller, the just let things be, all hail, chaos. Let disorder reign. Just do what you want to do, bro. That sort of thing. Indifferent freedom, arbitrary freedom, indiscriminate liberty, indiscriminate freedom. This is the enemy of art and the enemy of productivity. No, what Nietzsche is saying here is every artist requires constraint self-restraint, form. Where does freedom come from? Freedom comes from restraints that are imposed upon oneself. One imposes limits upon oneself and one works within those limits, the limits that the human self has oneself circumscribed. So freedom isn't just do whatever you want to do, whatever pops into your mind, just, just, you know, do whatever surfaces into your consciousness, do something completely random. No, no. Freedom means creating a law. You are the legislator of your own law and you impose that law upon yourself and you work within those perimeters, not parameters. That word is misused. No, you work within your own margins, your own boundaries, your own limits, the space that you yourself have set up, that you yourself have installed. And this is why laissez-aller writers do not create literature. I was thinking about this earlier this morning. It is still the morning. I was thinking about Jack Kerouac and J.D. Salinger. These are laissez-aller writers. They wrote without self-compulsion. They wrote without self-restraint. Now, I've talked about this elsewhere, but it seems to me that a writer of literature, not just a typer, a typist, not just a writer of fiction, popular fiction, commercial fiction, fiction that has no enduring value at all, fiction that is just made for money, no, the opposite of that is literature, genuine literature, authentic literature, and I'm not afraid to use that word, authentic literature, is written for oneself and not in order to make money. And the process of writing literature is this, and this is relevant to this passage. Sure, be arbitrary, be random in your notebook, in your first draft, but then rigorously and vigorously Go over the text and make deletions. Never begrudge yourself a deletion. Never begrudge yourself um, the excision of a word or a phrase that is repetitious or that is stale or that is empty or that's a cliche. 
rigorously go over that text again and again and again until it is as close to perfection as it is possible to be. 189, the industrious races find it immensely difficult to endure leisure. The sanctification of Sunday was a masterpiece of the English instinct. Use the mass to bore the Englishman so that he lusts after the weekday and the workday without him being aware of what has happened. The same is the case for the clever invention and the clever interposition of the fast. The quarantine? <laughs> Something similar can be perceived in all of its richness. In the ancient world, not to mention within the southern populations, though not with respect to work. There must be many different kinds of fasting. Wherever powerful drives and habits dominate, the lawgivers of that society interpolate leap days in which such drives are fettered, right? Lent, for example. Thus the drives learn once more what hunger means. I mean, this is the quadragesimal period. By the way, I wanted to issue a public correction. I mispronounced that word in an earlier video. I'm just correcting myself now. Quadragesimal, it means relating to a fast, uh, relating to Lent, for example. You know, it, it means 40 days, 40 days of fasting. Something similar can be perceived in all of its richness in the ancient world, not to mention within the southern populations, though not with respect to work. There must be many different kinds of fasting. Wherever powerful drives and habits dominate, the lawgivers of that society interpolate leap days in which such drives are fettered. Thus the drives learn once more what hunger means. When regarded from a higher position, any generation or epoch that seems to be afflicted by any kind of moral fanaticism is embedded with periods of compulsion and fasting in which a drive is cast down and suppressed and yet at the same time learns to purify itself and sharpen itself. There are even whole philosophical sects that allow such an interpretation, such as the Stoic school in the midst of Hellenistic culture, a culture which was suffused with aphrodisiacal fragrances. There was lewdness in the air. Here we have a clue to the elucidation of a paradox. Of all periods of human history, why was it within the Christian period in which Europe in general was under the yoke of Christian value judgments that the sexual drive was sublimated. Merci, Simone. Merci. Merci bien. 190. There is something in Plato's morality that doesn't really belong to Plato. There is something discoverable in Plato's philosophy, one might say, that exists in spite of Plato. I mean, the Socratism that Plato was really too dignified for. No one wants to hurt oneself. This means that everything that is bad is involuntary, for the bad man does injury to himself. He would never do such a thing if he knew that the bad were bad. Consequently, the bad man is only bad because of an error. If he removes his error, that makes him necessarily good. This type of inferring stenches of the mob, which only sees the painful consequences of acting badly and actually makes the judgment, it is dumb to do bad things. He identifies good with useful and agreeable, just like that. Anyone who follows the scent 
of moral utilitarianism to this source will seldom go wrong. Plato did all he could to interpolate something sophisticated and distinguished into the statement of his teacher. Above all, he tried to interpret himself within. He, the boldest of all interpreters who treated the whole of Socrates as if it were a popular theme or a folk song that he heard in the alley. I would compare it to a sport like football or baseball or hockey, but that's just me. Plato varied this theme into the infinite and the impossible with all of his own masks and multiplicities. In jest, one may say Homerically, what is the Platonic Socrates if not? One ninety one. The old theological problem of faith and knowledge, or to speak clearer, instinct and reason, therefore the question of whether the instincts deserve more authority than rationality in the valuation of things. Rationality asks for reasons, for a why. Rationality wants to know how to act and estimate with purposefulness and utility. It is always the old moral problem as it emerges in the person of Socrates long before Christendom sliced the spirit in two. Socrates initially put himself on the side of reason, according to the taste of his talent, that of the superior dialectician. In truth, what did he do throughout his life but laugh at the awkward ineptitude of his noble fellow Athenians, who were people of instinct, like all noble people, and who could never give information on the reasons for their actions. Ultimately, however, in silence and in secrecy, he laughed at himself. He discovered the same difficulty and ineptitude in himself. With all of his refined conscience and self-interrogation, what is the purpose then he persuaded himself. What is the purpose of freeing himself from the instincts? Give both the instincts and reason their due. One must follow the instincts and yet persuade reason to assist them with its good reasons. This was the real fallacy of that great, mysterious ironist. He made his conscience content with this form of self-deception. In fact, he saw through to the irrationality within moral judgments. Plato, who was in such matters innocent and who lacked the shrewdness of the plebeian, attempted, exerting a strength greater than that of any philosopher before him, to prove that reason and instinct reach the same goal, the good, in quotes, God. Since Plato, all theologians and philosophers have trod in the same path, that is to say, in moral matters, instinct, or as Christians call it, faith, or as I call it, the herd, dominates. Descartes, the father of rationalism, and thus the grandfather of revolution, needs to be exempted from the domination of instinct. He accorded all authority to reason. However, reason is nothing more than an instrument. And Descartes was superficial. <laughs> now, this next paragraph is extremely interesting. Um, Nietzsche is elaborating on his idea that we are all artists. We're not all artists in the genuine sense, though. I, I really want to emphasize that because he doesn't mean we're artists in the sense that we're creators of works of art. No, he's much more fastidious than that. Um, so am I. I mean, my standards for what constitutes art are much higher than that. The bar is much higher uh, than that for me, but also for Nietzsche. Um, but we are all artists in a sense because we fabricate the world. We construct a world that we know. And one of the things that we do, as Nietzsche will point out, is we have the tendency to assimilate and absorb new sensations and new impressions within 
a familiar framework. This is what all human beings do. What we do is we translate what is fresh, what is new, a fresh new impression into the language with which we are familiar. So for example, when we are reading, we don't usually read every single word. I mean, I do that with Nietzsche, uh, but very few of us are syllabic readers. We don't read every word. What we do, and Nietzsche doesn't exactly say this, but he means this, is we poeticize, we fabricate, right? We fantasticate, we poetically fantasticate and interject our own meaning into the text. So what we do is we guess what the rest of the sentence is. We read maybe five or six words within a sentence. And then what we do is we color the rest of the sentence because we are the colorists. We are the colorists and we are the flavorists of our own world. Now I have a personal example. I hope this interests you. Um, I was talking the other day about a film I had seen uh, a number of years ago. I saw it as a teenager and then I saw it for the first time on the big screen at the Gene Siskel Center in Chicago around 2012, I think. The film was The Witchfinder General from 1968, which I do recommend if you have, if you're not overly sensitive. If you're a very sensitive person, I do not recommend this film. In fact, I disrecommend it. Disrecommend is not a word, but it should be. Anyway, this film, as I point out, is really about the demonization of morality, uh, the diabolical, the making diabolical, the diabolicization of, the diabolization of the self-appointed moral good, right? Because you have a young soldier named Marshall who is seeking out a very wicked witch finder by the name of Matthew Hopkins and his associate. Now the associate of Hopkins violated Marshall's girlfriend, abused her, violated her uh, in a shocking way. And um, in fact, both of these sinister sadistic men are preying upon this poor woman throughout the film. Um, they are predators and she is the prey and it's, it's very disturbing. So Marshall wants revenge and he finds Hopkins and Hopkins toady, his minion, his assistant, these two vile witch finders, right? He discovers them and he wants his revenge. But in the process of exacting his revenge, Marshall becomes corrupted. You know, he enters into a space of total self-corruption, into total depravity. He becomes that which he rejects. He is the one who fights against monsters and he becomes a monster thereby. He is the one who fights against devils and becomes demonized thereby in the process of doing so. But why am I bringing this up? I mean, that's relevant for the earlier passage that I was discussing, but I, I really wanted to say something else. When I first saw this film as a young person, um, I remember the ending being more forceful, more violent, and more dramatic than it actually was. When I saw the film again in maturity, I noticed that the scene you know, it is dramatic, the final scene, it is dramatic, it is violent, it is, it is definitely dramatic, there's no question about it, but it was more subtle than I had imagined it. So what I did was my memory uh, fictionalized the film. I mean, in a way, I was the co-director of the film. It wasn't just Michael Reeves who directed this film. I was the co-director of this film because what I did was I embellished the film. I ornamented the film, right? Um, I, I highlighted certain things. I de-emphasized other things. Um, the film that I saw as a teenager was not the film that I saw in 2012, nor is it the film that I'm remembering, recollecting right now. So how many copies of The Witchfinder General are there? How many films are there called The Witchfinder General from 1968? 
Also, by the way, there's a butchered, mutilated version of the film that was released in the United States called The Conqueror Worm, The Conqueror Worm, which I don't recommend because it's censored, heavily censored. But anyway, um, there are as many versions of the Witchfinder General as there are spectators. And not only that, there are as many versions of the Witchfinder General as there are impressions of the film. So for example, within me, inside of me, there are three films called the Witchfinder General. The one that I saw when I was, I don't know, 15 years old, the one that I saw in 2012, and the one that I'm recollecting now as I'm speaking to you. So as Nietzsche will point out, when we look at a tree, there's a tree outside the window, we do not see the totality of the tree. We don't see what's behind the corner, what's behind that building. What we do is we fantasize. We are the fantasists. We are the fabulists, right? And we fantasize, we construct what is invisible. How? By activating the play of the transcendental imagination. And all that we perceive is the synthesis of the transcendental imagination. And that is why we are all fictionalists or fictionists or poets, but only, I hasten to add, in the broadest sense of the word. I'm not saying that everyone is a poet in the authentic meaning of the word poet, which is something else. 192. Whoever pursues the history of any particular science will find a guiding thread in its development. This guiding thread will help one understand the oldest and basest processes of all knowledge and cognition. Everywhere hasty hypotheses, fabrications, the stupid goodwill toward faith, the absence of mistrust, patience, all of these things develop first of all. Our senses learn too late, and they never completely learn how to become subtle, faithful, careful organs of cognition. It is more comfortable for our eye to reproduce an image that it has often produced before than to fasten its gaze on any new and different impression given any occasion. If the eye were to fix its gaze on a new and different impression, that would require more energy, more, in quotes, morality. It is discomforting and difficult for the ear to hear something new. We listen badly when we hear foreign music. Whenever we hear another language, we involuntarily attempt to reshape the sounds that we hear into words that sound more familiar and more native to us. For example, the ancient Germans transformed the word arkubalista, which they heard into armbrust. Armbrust, by the way, means crossbow. The new seems inimical and, and recalcitrant to our senses. Generally, affects such as fear, love, hatred, this includes passive affects such as laziness, dominate even the simplest processes of sensibility. Just as rarely today does a reader completely read each individual word or even the syllables on a page. Rather, he arbitrarily extracts around five out of 20 words and guesses the sense that presumably belongs to these five words. Even as rarely do we see a tree comprehensively and precisely as it is with respect to each leaf and each branch, with respect to every color and every form. It strikes us as so much easier to projectively fantasticate an approximation of tree. We do the same even in the midst of the strangest experiences. We fabricate for ourselves the greatest portion of our experiences, and it is hardly necessary to force ourselves to regard ourselves as the inventor of some process or another. All of this to say we are thoroughly and for all time habituated to lying. Or in order to phrase the same thing more virtuously and more hypocritically, that is more agreeably, 
we are far more artists than we know. When engaged in lively conversation, when engaged in a lively conversation, I often look at the face of the person with whom I am talking, every thought that she expresses or that I believe to have summoned from her. Every thought is so clearly and precisely determined before me that it is as if, it is as if the degree of clarity vastly exceeds the power of my optical faculty. The delicacy of the play of muscles and the expression of the eyes must have therefore been projectively poeticized by me. Perhaps this person made an entirely different expression or none at all. <laughs>